Okay, so uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, this is the title of my talk, Same Origin Policy Evaluation in Modern Browsers. Um, I'm one of the co-authors, Markus uh, Niemitz. Uh, the other co-authors are Jörg Schwenk and Christian Meinka. We are all from the uh, Ruhr University in Bochum, which is uh, in Germany. And uh, to be more explicit, we are working for the um, Horstgrass Institute for IT Security, maybe more well known. So this is how the uh, content table looks like. We have an introduction part and then uh, we go into some foundations. We will go into the uh, methodology and evaluation and third, uh, we go in regarding uh, the, the limitations. So there are a lot of them. We just have a look on a small subset. And uh, we also discuss uh, some access control policies for, because what we initially want is that we compare different access control policies and um, whether they match with the same original policy or not. So we will see that. And uh, last but not least, there is a conclusion part with an outlook and we will discuss some future work. So there's a lot of uh, things to do, but um, yeah, let's go through the talk. So first of all, the introduction and foundations part. Imagine the following case. We have a website and for example in Google Chrome or whatever and this website is called httpsbank.com and there is loaded some HTML code and a CSS code, a JavaScript on whatever and when we look into the document object model, so the DOM, we can see that depends always on the view but maybe the root element might be the window element and um, under the window element or um, as a child of a window element, we might have document, we might have a doc type, an HTML5 doc type, um, HTML4.01 or whatever, and um, a header body. And when we go even deeper, we also have uh, these fragments here, so script, image, uh, link, and many, many popular things. iframe, for example. So, and when we have this scenario here and make it a little bit more complex, um, there could be something like this. So we have a website with an iframe. So we have a window and a, yeah, a frame, uh, a sub-window. And this uh, frame here loads also a website. This is the same website with the same origin, bank.com. And um, we can see that there, oh, it's a small pointer, um, have an international bank account number here and um, yeah, also an amount. So we want to transfer 50 bucks to my bank account. And an honest uh, party like um, a developer from bank.com might say, well, let's change the amount to $10. So that is totally fine because we have act on the, the same origin. And the question arises, what happens when there is attackers.org? So this guy here is, um, you see that, attackers.org, and he wants to access code or content from bank.com. And in case that this might be possible, there, then we have a same origin policy bypass. This is, of course, uh, hopefully not possible, and um, the same origin policy protects us somehow, dependent on different origin uh, aspects like port protocol and domain, but this is just half of the truth. Uh, we have many, many uh, limitations, many um, exceptions. Uh, a well-known one is uh, Internet Explorer, which uh, doesn't care about the port and so on. And when you go into the DOM, so this is just a small abstract, um, we can see that there is something like a firewall, which is around the DOM of um, our iframe. So, and this firewall manages, well, do you have access or not? And currently, we are talking about the DOM SOP. So this is just a small, small subset of the same origin policy. Same origin policy is actually yeah, a set of uh, policies, and one subset is the DOM subset. There are also some other well-known policies like the local storage and session storage uh, SOP. We have um, an own SOP for AJAX for pseudo protocols like uh, data URIs, uh, JavaScript, uh, colon, and so on. Uh, even for Flash, Silverlight, and PDF. So PDF files have their own same origin policy. And uh, when we look on things like window.opener, 
we can also say that even a window or a tab has its own SOP. And maybe even most popular example on the slide is uh, the cookie example, because when you compare cookies, you have to compare another factor, so not only the port and um, the domain and protocol or schema, um, you also have to consider the path. So um, each yeah, aspect has its own SOP. And what we did is, in case of the DOM SOP, that we considered resources once they have been loaded. So imagine the case that you go on bank.com and there is an image. This image will be loaded, and after it is loaded, we check whether it can get access to the website of bank.com. So there might be script in an image, which is possible when you look on yeah, searching files, searching content files. And um, well, this is somehow complicated. What we also did is that we considered um, the RFC 6454 from Adam Bath. Um, here's just a small quote um, of this RFC. Um, I'll just read it. An image is passive content and therefore carries no authority, meaning the image has no access to the object and resources available to its origin. Which means for me that an image is actually not able to execute active code because it's somehow passive, right? In 2011 at the CCS conference, um, there were some guys, uh, including Mario Heiderich, who published a paper about SVGs and they wrote there that SVGs, which are actually images or scalable vector graphics, can include JavaScript code. And um, this JavaScript code can look like this one. So we have an SVG element, we have a script element inside of that um, SVG, and an alert as a proof of concept, um, a circle, just to show that there is something in there. And when we use the image element, for example, in the newest Chrome, um, we see that the circle will be displayed here. So we don't have the alert one window, but when we use the uh, embed element here, or object, yeah, we have a script execution. So dependent on the HTML element, uh, the browser uh, allows you to execute JavaScript. So obviously, we have a huge impact of the embedding element, which is in this case image or embed. So the RSC might not match exactly, so that depends always on the view, but it's totally important that we have that. And uh, we ask ourselves, well, which research questions might be interesting? And um, here they are, so three of them. How is the SOP for DOM access implemented in modern browsers? So what is the current situation? Second, uh, which parts of the HTML markup influences SOP DOM? So we saw that the embedding element is definitely a very important aspect. So the element which loads your resource is very, very important. And third, how does the detected behavior match known access control policies? So we thought, well, wouldn't it make sense to have a formal model and to describe the SOP with something like discretionary access control or role-based access control, because everybody knows how role-based access control models work in general, hopefully. And, well, we will see what the results are. So this is uh, on my second point here on the slide. This is exactly the, the same ordering as it is in our paper. So a methodology and evaluation. In our methodology, we have uh, such a test set up here. So in this case, we have the host document, which is a browser which loads bank.com. So the first example which I showed you. And then we have an embedding element. So this embedding element could be an image, an embed element, an object element, or for example, a script element, or an iframe even. And when we have a case of an, of an iframe, an iframe can load another website, another yeah, sub-DOM. And this website is here listed with the embedded document. So we have the iframe which loads content and this content is called the embedding document content. And when we look on the host document, so the first website and the included website, the embedded 
document, we see that there is something like a firewall that manages the access model, uh, access control. So, for example, when we have JavaScript uh, code on the bank.com scenario, we might have read access on HTML code or actually the DOM API of um, the, the iframes website, which is uh, also bank.com. And the other way around, when we have a we we website from, from loaded in the iframe, then there might be some access uh, methods to yeah, communicate with the host documents website. So we have both directions here, which is totally fine. And we even have uh, next to read and write um, access also the a low script execution method. So what this means is that um, you maybe know iframes, for example, have a sandbox attribute. And the sandbox attribute allows us to, for example, um, deny the execution of JavaScript code to um, make the origin a random origin, hopefully, and some other aspects. So we can influence by setting the, the sandbox uh, attribute, the whole DOM, yeah? so, so at least parts of the DOM. And what we also see here is uh, that the SOP is obviously influenced by a few factors which we considered. So first of all, the embedding element, I told you that, um, image versus embed, for example, sandbox and cores, so cross-origin resource sharing. We considered cores because um, yeah, from our point of view, we also have a startup. Um, there are many, many customers who use cores and they make it totally wrong. So they have a wrong configuration and it's, it's actually a little bit complex. And you will see that this complexity leads to a lot of bugs. So we built a test tool which is available online via yoursop.com. I go into my Google Chrome here, make it full screen. And um, so as I told you, yoursop.com. And we see that there are different test cases. And when we click on this button here, there will be evaluated right after we click um, how we are, isn't it? What do you mean? Oh, OK, interesting. Uh, OK. Then this way here. Perfect. <laughs> so this is the website. And when we click on this button here, we, um, our test cases will be evaluated right after the click. And what we see is, for example, that we have partial read access in case that we have same origins um, and when we use the image element. So there are different elements considered. There are different origins considered. So at one um, time, the, the same origin case, then other origins. And we go through read, write, and execute. So let me go over here, for example. We see our test code, how we tested uh, read access in this case. So you can check that directly. For, we can also click, for example, here. And you see that will we'll be directly evaluated uh, a lot of test cases. In total, 544. And there is another thing which um, might be useful next to your own browser, which you can test as a browser vendor or whatever, um, is this one here. So we created a test bed which compares, I'll make it a little bit smaller, uh, different browsers. So we used uh, Google Chrome, Firefox, IE, Edge, and Safari, Opera, and Chromodo. We actually hope that Chromodo is completely broken, but um, yeah, it, indeed it is. And um, we see that there are different test cases. And what we want is that we want to detect differences across browsers. So this, the first row here isn't interesting for us because every browser has partial read access in case of images loaded by the same origin. But when we click on only display differences, we can see that there are a lot of differences. 126 cases from 544 cases, so over 23%, you know, are different in at least one browser. So, for example, in this case here, we can see that we, the recommendation based on the majority is that we have 
uh, read access, and most of the browsers have uh, partial access. But in Firefox and IE and Edge, we don't have access. So something might be wrong here. So is this OK or is this a bug? This is up to you. So let's go to the presentation part. So what we did is that after creating our tool is that we categorized our browser differences. And first of all, we saw that over 12% uh, percent of the test cases were different because of a bug in Safari, nine. So what we, um, yeah, it might be our fault, um, missed is that we didn't use image SVG plus XML as the content type. But Safari 9 required that, though it wasn't yeah, standardized in the W3C standards or uh, what WG. And uh, this behavior was fixed in Safari 10.1. So it was maybe, obviously, uh, a Safari bug. And this is a little bit more interesting. Over 35% of the test cases were caused in case of canvas elements. So uh, we tested the most yeah, let me say, um, used and well-known elements like link, script, uh, and uh, frame. And this also includes Canvas because uh, you can, for example, communicate uh, yeah, with image elements, which we also tested. So this is actually related to it. And we see that Canvas uh, loading content, um, and this content is PNG or SVG, in combination with cores, yeah, have a lot of differences. Also links, so when we load CSS code with it, um, there is uh, yeah, a lot of differences, over 60, 70 uh, differences, just because of the link element in combination with course. So course is obviously a huge problem. When we count them together, we are over 86% so of our test cases who have problems with course due to its complexity, I think. We also detected one Browser vulnerability, there might be even more browser vulnerabilities in our test bed, but we were not able to detect them. Uh, you can look through it, maybe you find one. And, well, let's go through it. So, let me that check you on the tool. So, we once again go to the tool here, and the interesting line is link, so I look for it, and we see that this one here, might be interesting because every browser denies access and the only browsers, oh, so, <laughs> um, beside of two browsers, and the only browsers who allow access are IE and Edge, so the Microsoft browsers. And yeah, we ask ourselves, well, why is it the case and what kind of test case is it? So when we go through it, we have a um, different origin, so not the same origin case, we have a cross origin case. We are using the link element. We don't use cores. This is not set. And we have a read situation. So we want to read CSS code from another origin. This shouldn't be possible, right? Because when we can do that, we could, for example, um, make a lock-in oracle. Who knows? And the other way around, we can not only read code, we can also write code cross-origin which means that we can, for example, do scriptless attacks, which we announced in 2012 at CCS. So um, scriptless attacks, for you who maybe don't know it, um, are attacks which are with CSS code and sometimes similar to cross-site scripting. So you have some parts which act similar. So there is a huge impact by writing and reading CSS code, CSS lines cross-origin. Okay, so here's an example how we can use this bug. So imagine the following case. You are visiting a website, for example, startpage.me. I think the bug is still there. And what you see is that depending on your login state, the CSS file will change its content. So when we look, for example, in the first line of this website, we see that the button uh, is displayed in green. 
you know, when you're logged in. And when you're logged out, the button is displayed in red. So the CSS code, the CSS file changes its content depending on your logged in state. And we know from our tool that we can read out the CSS uh, lines cross origin. So for example, with yeah, this uh, proof of concept here, an alert window with document style sheets zero, so the first style sheet, CSS rules zero, CSX text. So we read the first line of the loaded CSS file. And how can we do that? Just by including a link element on our host document website, on our attacker's website, which loads the attackable CSS uh, file. So for example, from victim.com or startpage.lme. So this is the result in IE on the left side and on the right side in Google Chrome. IE, as you can maybe see it, reads out the line perfectly and shows it in the alert window. And um, this is just a POC. And uh, on the right side, we have an exception here. And Google Chrome denies access. So we cannot read out the CSS code with its browser, which is actually the right decision. So limitations and access control policies. There are actually a lot of limitations. We had a look on a few elements on a, yeah, some origin aspects. So we only considered HTTP. Yeah. We uh, considered different domains, not different ports, and many, many other things. So when you look on the limitations, you can even make write a book about them. So um, for example, uh, you have limitations in case of link uh, elements. There are CSS imports. As there are web workers, uh, service workers. We have SVG content, um, JavaScript execution inside of the SVG via Xlink, and many, many more things. Pseudo protocols. You can even define your own pseudo protocol. So if it's, for example, possible to define burger colon yeah, as a pseudo protocol. And this is a totally new area and might have also some new SOP bugs, who knows. And the cool thing about it, or actually worst thing about it, is that um, the attack surface might grow with each new feature. So the last part of our paper discusses different access control policies. And just to make it short, um, we discussed the discretionary access control model, which you maybe know from Unix systems, read, write, execute. Um, Role-based access control models, we yeah, also proposed enhanced role-based access control models um, and attribute-based access control. Yeah, we we'll discussed it if it could be matched to, to the SOP model. And maybe just to give you one example, when you look on the discretionary uh, access control model, you maybe think that because of the name, the same origin policy only gives you access in case of the same origin policy case, right? But obviously, this is not the case when we look on script elements, because script elements can include content from another origin which will be executed on in your own origin by just including it. So there, you could build a matrix, you could build a discretionary access control matrix with it, but it's not really easy to do that. And we might think that a role-based access control model and attribute-based access control model might be a better decision. But um, yeah, there are many, many more aspects about it. Also, by the way, the role-based access control model might be a good fit because we saw that the embedding element like uh, yeah, image or embed um, is a yeah, huge um, factor, a very important aspect of the SOP. So conclusions and future work. There are definitely different browser data sets and um, we found a lot of inconsistencies, nearly yeah, 23% of the um, test cases were different, most of them because of course. And we can s we actually see that each new feature, each new browser complexity uh, might lead to security bugs. So think about it when you yeah, introduce a new HTTP header or when you introduce a new attribute which might protect you. 
So there will be definitely bugs, and it's hard to, to, to implement them. We talked about, um, with the W3C and uh, WattVG uh, guys, uh, about some test cases. And even these guys don't have all test cases for the most popular elements um, in case of course. So there's a lot of things to do, and um, yeah, you could maybe help. Future work might be also uh, to consider other subsets. Maybe Silverlight might be interesting. Um, different pseudo protocols, data UIs, for example, and uh, different HTML elements and attributes, especially when we look on HTML5 and some other uh, new, yeah, let me say, standards. Um, we might find new things, new features, which um, make the situation a little bit worse. And, well, I hope that you enjoyed the talk, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, very nice. Very good work. Also very valuable. Um, when you displayed these big tables, so you had like yeah. this binary thing, so this full access, no access, and then you had the partials. So what I was thinking about, did you check if partial access of browser A is the same partial access as B, or do we also have differences there? Uh, partial access is, uh, for example, when you uh, test for, if you can read off the pixel of an image. And the test case is the same when you look at the same origin or cross origin, so there is no difference in the test case. Okay, so it's um, the same. So it's not. Uh, yeah. I can one browser can read some of the parts, but others. Have, so they will uh, check for that. Yeah, we didn't implement that, but um, yeah, there might. Yeah, there could be some differences. Okay, so yeah. future work. Good point. And the other thing that I was thinking about. So again, the same origin policy is much older than course, and course was introduced yeah. to give some more flexibility. Um, but course comes from a time where people knew how important the web is and also how to write specification and how to do proper work. So I always thought course is one of the prime examples to do something right. Yeah. So I'm so very surprised that you find a lot of inconsistencies yeah. with course. So is the behavior of, or the influence of that course has in the behavior of the browser, is this properly documented or is this what now the browser vendors come up ad hoc? Yeah, from my personal point of view, um, it might be that course is actually too complex. And, um, we, I mean, we saw that in case of CSP, right? CSP 1.0 was actually very simple, and there were not so many bugs. Then we had CSP 2.0, then we have 3.0, and the complexity grows. And then we have guys like Ben or you who write uh, cool papers about the SOP and how to uh, bypass the, the same original, uh, the, the content security policy. So I, I think that you should reduce the complexity. This is maybe the most important thing. But this is always de depends on the view. So. Okay, so I don't have to introduce myself. Um, about the reading of CSS cross-domain. Um, so I know that, for example, like this get-computed style was kind of changed such that you can't do history stealing anymore. But I'm wondering if you cannot actually use side channels. Like, for example, if you know that the font size uh, is specified and you see basically where the next element after that after the text is. And did you also consider that in your, your test bed? Like these side channel kind of things you can do? No, no, you can do we didn't test that. We uh, discussed that in uh, our CCS paper in 2012 with scriptless attacks, but um, not in this case. So it took a lot of time to, to implement these test cases, believe me. So a lot cool. of them. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, thanks again, Marcus. Yeah, thanks.